It's been 10,777 days since the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And you are parked in the access aisle. My name is Robbie Kopp. And my name is Sarah Nichols, and we are your co-hosts for this episode of The Access Isle. Welcome, everyone, and happy 2020. This is our first episode of the year. Hope that you'll go back and check out our content from 2019, and that you'll subscribe and get updates as we release them for The Access Isle. Yeah, we've got a lot of good stuff on there. Um, so today, we're going to be taking a look back at 2019, and we'll be looking forward into the new year. Uh, 2020 is a very big year for a lot of different reasons. We have the census, we have the presidential elections, and we have the 30th anniversary of the ADA. Can I get a whoop whoop? Whoop whoop! And we have um, very ambitious goals for this year, right, Robbie? Absolutely. So right at the start of the year, we released our legislative agenda. We're introducing several bills with our state legislators and senators, and we can't wait to get you listeners involved. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's look back at the highlights of 2019. Well, what would you say were some of the highlights from this year? I don't know. There was so many things that were a really big deal. I mean, I was hired, so obviously that's a big one. <laughs> um, but maybe more importantly, some might say, uh, Able South Carolina celebrated its 25th anniversary. Uh, so we've been empowering independence for people with disabilities since 1994. That was a long time ago, and what a half century it's been. 2019 alone, so just one year provided 11,880 services to individuals with disabilities. And we hope to increase that number in 2020. And so looking for a more national perspective, I know one bill that received some attention was the Raise the Wage Act. It received a lot of attention for its potential to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but it would also do something very important for people with disabilities, and that is ending subminimum wage. Robbie, do you want to explain what that is for our listeners? Absolutely. I think what's really interesting is Raise the Wage Act, when it first came through, the House got a lot of attention, but didn't really get a whole lot of attention for the huge impact it would have on subminimum wage. So taking a step back towards what subminimum wage is, uh, right now, as the rules are written, it is allowable for organizations that get a special certificate to pay people with disabilities less than the minimum wage. So, Sarah, I'm going to put you on the spot. How old do you think these rules are? Oof. Um, I would guess 75 years. 75 years? You were pretty close. Nice. Really stinking close. Too close for me to do the math on. Um, but really, uh, the rules for four, we call the Certificate 14C, uh, it's part of the Fair Labor Standards Act from 1938. Because we should follow every 1938 rule. In Nothing's 20, changed since then. 2020. No, uh, just about everything has changed. So um, I think it's it's really fascinating that we continue to try to follow something that maybe had uh, some reason back in the past, but really makes no sense at all. We have to value the work of people with disabilities by paying them fairly. One of the things that I really hate about the subminimum wage conversation is that we find ourselves advocating for the minimum for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Like, can't even count on minimum wage. Uh, and minimum wage isn't high enough as it is. I think in addition to the really devastating impact that subminimum wage has has on individuals, has is, that's fine, um, has on individuals is the damage that it does culturally. Because subminimum wage exists, Oftentimes, employers expect that they can get away with less or paying less for people with disabilities. That devalues disability uh, experience and innovation, and it really just it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, and that brings us to one of uh, one of the big targets that we're working on at Evil SC and through the Hire Me SC campaign, and that is supporting. Uh, employment first, which is competitive and integrated employment for people with disabilities. Do you want to kind of bring our listeners up to speed on what happened with employment first in 2019 and where we might be going with it? Absolutely. So I'm going to actually go back out of 2019. In 2018, uh, we had been advocating for 
uh, a bill that would give some some clout to an organization, a, a small commission that would provide input on disability employment in South Carolina. We got all the way to third read on the Senate floor after it made it through the House. And guess what? There was a floor amendment and the floor amendment changed uh, the bill into a study committee instead of a commission, uh, which functionally may not sound like all that big a difference, but but it was a really big difference. So uh, it did pass as a study committee, which at least that happened. That is good news. Mm -hmm. Uh, The study committee uh, convened and got together uh, our executive director was part of that. Kimberly Tiso was on that study committee, along with Mandy Powers Norell, Representative Mandy Powers Norell, uh, and a few other folks. And they put together a comprehensive report on kind of the a snapshot of disability employment in South Carolina. And that report was released last year in 2019 in May, and really has some huge highlights. It sure does. Disclaimer, I have not memorized all of this, but I happen to have some facts before me here that I can share with you. Um, So this is a very important report uh, because it's really establishing why we need employment first and competitive integrated employment for people with disabilities. So first, it kind of looks at how South Carolina is behind in some ways. So currently, out of the 727,000 South Carolina residents who have a disability, 67 67 percent are unemployed which means that south carolina has the sixth highest unemployment rate for people with disabilities in the nation and that's a list that we don't want to be at the top of so this report also highlighted some states that have become a model for employment first legislation because if we want to change things we want to see how what's been successful in other states as well And what they found was that 32 states have already adopted policies supporting the employment of people with disabilities. And it looks slightly different in those different states, but it's, you know, same common principles. But unfortunately, you know, South Carolina is not one of them who has adopted this. So I don't know, maybe 2020 is the year. But Robbie, what do you think a model employment first state might look like? There are so many things that states can do to further employment first. And employment first is really that idea that for serving folks with disabilities, the first and preferred outcome is competitive and integrated employment. So every one of those words kind of packs a punch. We want to make sure folks are are working uh, shoulder to shoulder with people without disabilities and that they're getting paid a fair wage, making the same uh, as, their, as their colleagues and coworkers in the field. So what we see as, as really positive steps towards that is the state potentially is a model employer. So here in South Carolina, the state has a purview over about 92,000 positions across state government and through state government contracts, which is a huge number. Uh, If we found that we could be inclusive in hiring 92,000 positions in and with representation in every single county, that could have a huge cultural shift. We also know that there's a lot of service providers that have, uh, that they answer to state government in some way and really making sure that those uh, service providers are pushing towards competitive integrated employment, not sheltered workshops, not enclave employment, not contracts they have with companies so that they can do the work offsite and pay people pennies on the dollar. It's not what we're looking for. We're looking for competitive and integrated employment. There's a few challenges that we've got to continue to address in South Carolina. We don't have any statewide incentives for hiring people with disabilities. We don't have good data on what our mm-hmm. utilization rates are right now, which I think is is a huge problem. We don't know if we're doing well or poorly uh, based on employment data. What we do know is that from demographic data, about two thirds of folks with disabilities in South Carolina aren't working right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not where we want to be, especially as the, the last number, I, I checked this out a couple of days ago, the last unemployment number for South Carolina <laughs> The unemployment rate, 2.6% in October, which is, I don't know that I would have ever expected it to be that low, and it's probably going to end up getting lower over the next few months as well. But knowing that two-thirds of people with disabilities that are working age aren't working right now, there's there's definitely a clear gap here. Because mm-hmm. if you you know put yourself in the perspective of a business owner or an employer, you might be hiring for certain positions because you're trying to grow your company and you're having trouble actually finding anyone to fill those positions because the un- because the employment rate is so high or the employment rate is so low. So 
you, you know, you have a problem there is that you need good candidates to help make your company better and you're not finding them. Well, here we've just perfectly listed there's this huge untapped workforce of people with disabilities who they can work and they want to work. Um, often they are seen as incapable of doing the job or the ways that they might do something differently is perceived as not being able to do it correctly when that's just not true. Or they might have the perception that they don't want to work, but that is very often not the case and it's uh, the perfect solution to the problem of the labor shortage that we're currently facing. Yeah, and we've talked some about employment in a previous podcast, and we really had a kind of a personal spin on that from uh, a colleague, Callie Sandal, and, and what her experience has been on employment. So feel free to, to listen back mm-hmm. to that podcast episode. Uh, also, I think it's it's super important to think about where we're headed. So with employment, it's a, it's a fairly complicated problem, but the math just makes sense <laughs> that employing people with disabilities is... is what should be the norm. And I think that um, that math kind of puts pressure on employers for us to get there. Uh, But really, I think there's more room for us to understand what the particular pitfalls are in South Carolina, uh, which is why I'm excited in 2020. uh, There is legislation that's been introduced that would set up the Employment First Commission uh, Mm -hmm. as we had hoped for the year before last. I think Being able to have the study committee and have a study committee report and have some of the problems clearly laid out gives us kind of shoulders to stand on as we address employment barriers in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say employment of people with disabilities is a nonpartisan issue, and we're super excited that out of the gate there is bipartisan support. The the two sponsors uh, are Representative Collins out of Greenville and Representative Powers Norell out of the Lancaster area. Uh, so mm-hmm. we have folks on both sides of the aisle that are really wanting to address disability employment gaps. Because mm-hmm, this is an issue that impacts everyone and also benefits everyone if it's if it's um, integrated. So the name of that bill is the Employment First Initiative Act, and it's the current number of the bill is H4768. Um, And, you know, if you are listening to us right now and you're thinking, yes, that's great. People with disabilities can work. They want to work. How can I help? You might be asking. Well, um, one great way to do this is by contacting your representatives and letting them know about the issues that you care about. Um, But more on that later. We are also working on two other bills that have not yet been introduced, but will be soon, which are the Disability History and Awareness Month bill and the Supported Decision Making Act. Robbie, aren't you excited for these two? I'm excited for both (laughs) of these. And uh, Sarah, you just mentioned uh, contacting your lawmakers and being part of that process. Uh, You're not alone if you're thinking about doing that. So we're going to be releasing a podcast that kind of walks you through the steps. How do you make a relationship with an elected leader? Mm -hmm. So more to come. Don't wait for us. But if you feel like you need a little extra support, there will be a podcast episode coming on that topic specifically. Absolutely. Uh, But let's talk a little bit about the other the other legislation that we're going to be angling for in 2020. Yeah. So I've been really excited about the potential for a disability history and and awareness month that's established um, within the schools. So, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I know that as a student going through the public school system in South Carolina, public school, public yeah. schools, uh, I never learned about disability history or rights. And even when we did learn about historical figures who had a disability, like FDR, for example, that was never actually brought into the conversation. So this is something that a lot of us who are even now integrated into the movement didn't learn about until much later in life, even if some of us had disabilities and didn't even know it. I think the biggest takeaway from me from public school and FDR was how much he had to hide his disability. Mm -hmm. So if there's one takeaway from a leader that has a disability... And that one takeaway is that they had to hide. Um, that's just not not a great sign. I think there's so much more that we can do around disability awareness and really touching the historical aspect of that. Uh, and teaching about you know disability history, there there's so many benefits to that as well beyond just being aware of yeah. your own history. Yeah, right? nice, yeah. <laughs> um, I think when when students with disabilities are able to see a role model, someone that they can look to and identify with and see, Hey, my, this, this diagnosis or or whatever's going on with me, um, isn't the death sentence that my doctor said it is, or it isn't the, the death sentence that 
my my school guidance counselor thinks it is. I think that's just hugely important. We have mm-hmm. historical figures uh, from a lot of different places, a lot of different walks of life that have experience with disability, and having those role models are hugely helpful. And then I think just the the rights, the disability rights movement itself, and seeing the disability community rise up and organize and uh, get connected with other rights movements and and share in struggle and host sit-ins and chain uh, mm-hmm. wheelchairs to public transit. I think it's it's so important to see that disability access is, is something that we have to fight for, but there's also the success that we have had in disability rights and making sure that we're, we're kind of standing on those shoulders. I'm all about standing on shoulders today. Um, Who are you stepping on, Robbie? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but being able to, to build on that work and legacy, and, and really that is... A huge part of ADA 30, we do a lot of just basic disability sensitivity training. And when I'm providing that training to pros uh, in the field, I always ask how long if people with disabilities had equal rights under the law. And I hear all kinds of things. um, And usually it's somewhere in the 60s or the 70s. uh, But the truth is this, this struggle for access has gone on much longer than that. And the biggest win of that movement with the Americans with Disabilities Act isn't that old from a historical mm-hmm. perspective. Only so 30 years ago. Only 30 years. So we've got to continue that work in progress. And you can't continue on it if nobody ever tells you that it happened. Exactly. And we are, you know, lucky that we have, you know, Women's History Month, African American History Month, and all these great things so that we really learn about leaders in these movements and these marginalized communities. And you know, we just want disability history to be included in that and taught um, taught as well. And I think I don't think we mentioned this, but it's also learning about this is really great just for fostering individual disability pride. Mm-hmm. Um, it can even Absolutely. help decrease bullying around disability in schools, because for people who do not have disabilities, who might either be unsure of how to approach a person with a disability just because they've never been taught about it. This kind of helps bridge that gap and just really fosters more understanding um, in an age where, you know, where kids are really trying to learn more and just understand the world and everything that they're seeing. Yeah. And I think once we talk about that personal perspective, being able to see where you fit as a person with a disability historically and what you've had to fight for, I think the the level of empowerment that brings is really closely related to this supported decision-making idea Mm -hmm. uh, that we're trying to press legislatively this year as well. So right now, without an alternative, a recognized alternative to guardianship, uh, a lot of families and a lot of school personnel and doctors feel like uh, if I'm involved with a young adult with a disability, uh, the only option for me is to get a guardianship when they turn 18. Uh, Let's pause for a minute there (laughs) and let's... Let's explain what guardianship means. There, there is a bunch of different types of guardianship, and it can look different ways. But let's just well, let's keep it let's keep it on the simple mm-hmm. side. We can dive into this issue um, in another podcast with so another keep podcast listening. or uh, with other other content that we can host. Um, so, in broad strokes, uh, the idea of a guardianship is is something that is court decided. And when someone has a guardianship, it basically takes away their uh, legal ability to make decisions for themselves. In some cases, that even includes the right to vote. So it can be incredibly limiting uh, where an individual can't sign their own checks because that's signing a legal document. Uh, They can't sign other paperwork, disclosures, all kinds of things. And they're really reliant on this person who is an appointed guardian to make those legal decisions For them. Uh, Once someone is in a guardianship, the only way to get back out is through another uh, lengthy court process. And what we're seeing is if there is if there's an alternative that could be recognized legally in South Carolina as a way to support the decision making of people with disabilities, uh, then maybe people wouldn't be funneled into guardianship as often as we see right now. So that's really the, the focus on supported decision making. We supported decision making as a recognized term. You may see SDM for short. What we're going for with supported decision making is really just a legal recognition of how everybody makes decisions anyways. Yes. And, you know, we know that parents or, you know, guardians, when people are 
under 18 are really trying to find the best options for their youth with disabilities, um, but they might not always know what all of those options are. And supported decision making is just another great option to have. It would allow people with disabilities to still be in control of their own lives and their own decisions while still having a trusted group of professionals and family members in place to help guide them in their decisions. Because that's how everyone makes decisions, right? For those listening, if you've made a big financial decision, a a purchase of a car, a Mm -hmm. house, or anything like that, I'm sure you asked some experts that you trust, either about houses or cars or finances or all of the above. Yeah, Uh, I mean, I know I consulted a lot of people before I decided to adopt a dog, maybe even more people than I needed to, but it was a big decision and I wanted to make sure that I was committing to something that that would turn out well. It would be good for me. Absolutely. Well, that's that's so much of what supported decision making is. It's having that kind of circle of trusted advisors and allies and keeping the individual's ability to decide for themselves completely intact. Mm -hmm. So we'd love to see recognition of supported decision making as an alternative to guardianship in South Carolina. We sure do. Um, So that kind of covers our main legislative agenda for 2020. So we talked about employment first, disability history and awareness, and supported decision making. Of course, there are several other things that will come up in the course of a year that we might um, support and share information about. But this is kind of the crux of our 2020 year and and what we're going to be taking action on a lot. Yeah, and these are state issues. So on the state side, we have already released kind of a summary overview of our legislative agenda. And we'll share that wherever you uh, get your podcast. Uh, Check back at the Podbean website and also on Able SC's website for each episode listing where you can get a link to that targeted action. Because right now you can fill out a a very simple form, uh, contact your lawmaker and let them know that disability rights are important to Mm -hmm. you and that you want them to keep an eye out for uh, employment, supported decision making and disability rights history integration into education. Yes. So get involved. Yes. And I love this system so much because it's so simple um, and it kind of takes some of those lengthy bureaucratic steps out of the process for you. If you are listening right now and you want to jot down a quick link, I do have a shortened bit.ly link for you. So I'm going to say that, but we will also link it down below in case you didn't catch it. So the link would be bit.ly slash able SC action. If you enter that in, it'll take you right to our form where you just put in um, a just a little bit of information and the website will identify your state representative and senator for you. So you don't even have to go in knowing who those are, but you will when you leave and they'll provide you, we will provide you with some talking points so you can customize your message, but still have some guidance on what you might want to say. And then you email it out to them and you're done. Easy peasy. You can also tweet it. So the platform will walk you through on how to tweet the action that you took and even flag the your lawmaker and make sure that uh, they're aware of what we're looking for mm-hmm. in 2020. Some of these lawmakers do like to be active on Twitter, and it's a way that they engage with their constituency. So that's sometimes a way to get a faster response than via email, but I think both are very important. Um, and social media is also a great way to encourage your friends to also take action. So... Now that we've covered our main goals this year, what can we look forward to maybe on a larger scale? We, we know there is a ton of content in this podcast episode. So I hope that you will take the time to listen, re-listen, share. Take notes. Take notes, share it with a friend, talk with a friend about it after they get to listen. Um, but there's really a lot going on. So we've covered the state uh, legislative agenda. Now I want to share with you some of the big picture um a few federal issues that are going on right now so that we can be aware and be active with that. First is uh, we're going to be celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, Yeah, the ADA is huge. Uh, It is uh, a piece of civil rights legislation uh, focused on disability access that covers employment. It covers governmental programs and services. It covers public places like private businesses, movie theaters, restaurants, It also uh, covers telecommunications and protects people when they exercise their rights under the ADA. So it's really monumental, and it's so important that we celebrate it. I want to share, too, that 
it's especially important that we celebrate it and that people know that we're proud of the Americans with Disabilities Act because it seems to be under almost constant assault. Mm-hmm. Right now, there is a House bill in the U- United States House of Representatives. It's H.R. 4099, 4099. And it would basically gut the current enforcement arm of the ADA and make it so individuals with disabilities would have to inform a business that they have been discriminated against by their building exactly what's wrong, how to fix it, and then wait for a response from that business. That response may take a month, and in that response, they don't even have to say, I fixed it already. They can say, well, I'll fix it in six months. So really, seven months of waiting around for barriers to be removed after 30 years of waiting doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, But it does appear to make sense to Representative Joe Wilson and Representative Tom Rice, uh, two South Carolina representatives that have signed on to support this bill. Let's slow the train and make sure that they know the negative impact this would have on the disability community. Yes, um, that's very important. And speaking of the ADA, anyone who's listening today, you're hearing this first. Um, but we will be having, <laughs> I think Robbie's hearing this first. What too. is it? <laughs> he looks very interested. Um, we will be hosting events throughout the upcoming summer to celebrate the ADA and um, just fostering disability pride in general. And that's something we're going to want the whole community um, and all intersectional communities involved in. So definitely be on the lookout and stay tuned for more information on that soon. But we will have exciting stuff going on this summer. Woohoo! That's that's what Dory would say. Um, an- another really big uh, federal movement that we're seeing right now is the census. The census happens once a decade Um, I expect that we'll dedicate a whole podcast episode. I'm not sure how many podcast episodes we've promised in this one episode, but they're all coming. We're going to have to get started. Uh, For the census, we're going to talk about really the the value in being counted and the impact that an accurate count has. Uh, We know that people with disabilities are, are less likely to be counted in a census, and we'd like to turn that on its head in 2020. There are so many federal resources and dollars that could come back to South Carolina when we have the accurate counts of people with disabilities, people without disabilities, uh, making sure that we're getting our fair share in South Carolina. So that's huge. Uh, There will be specifics directly from the Census Bureau that you'll be getting starting in March. And Census Day is on April 1st. April 1st. What a funny day. Funny day. It is. It's April Fool's Day. But you know what it also is? I have a feeling I know. It is also (laughs) Advocacy Day for Access and Independence. How'd you know? (laughs) Um, Advocacy Day for Access and Independence is a huge event. It is the disability rights celebration at the State House that takes place each year. We are holding it on April 1st. Disability rights ain't no joke, but we are having it on April Fool's Day anyways. Um, it's also census day. So the day we celebrate the census will also be the day that we celebrate disability rights. And really one of the key messages that's going to come out of that is I count because it's so important that everyone with a disability is counted. We're not talking about tracking you, just talking about getting an accurate count so that the feds know how to allocate transportation dollars and housing dollars Mm -hmm. and so many other dollars, uh, to back to South Carolina. And like we were talking about earlier, um, in not having sufficient data in some of these areas, being counted in the census will help with that. You know, going back to Advocacy Day, if you are listening and you haven't been to one before or you might be curious about it, it is awesome, first of all. Just thought I'd throw that so. out there. Um, but it's also a great opportunity to really show the power that people with disabilities have in our community and in the legislative process. I know last year we had, I think, over 20 partners involved, and we had about 600 people turn out at the state house. 587 was our peak count mm-hmm. at Advocacy Day. And I mean, that really demonstrates the the power that the disability community can can hold and that, you know, we want to share our voice and we want to be counted. Um, and it's also a really great introduction to people who 
who might want to get involved in the legislative process or just want to find a community of people who care about the same issues that they care about. Um, so it's really like a great introductory moment or a place to expand upon your activism. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of a jump off point. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times for folks that haven't been involved or evolved, weird, um, <laughs> haven't been involved in You've a political process. Evolved. Yeah. Some way or another, <laughs> um, haven't been involved in a political process. Uh, advocacy day is a really great way to see how easy it is to get in front of the folks that are elected to serve us at the state house, uh, get in front of the folks that make decisions on what our life looks like, uh, on a day to day basis. And it's also just a really fun, easy day to come and hang out with, uh, people from across the state with a lot of different experiences, all raising one call for access and independence. Mm -hmm. Talk about community. For sure. <laughs> Again, that's April 1st. Um, so if you're interested in attending, it, of course, is free to attend. It's a public event. But we do like to have an idea of the numbers of people who will be attending. So if you go to our website, able-sc.org, uh, you can find a link to register on there. Or you can check out Advocacy Day's own website, Unlocking barriers sc.org. Mm -hmm. Check it out. Um, what's really cool and what I'm especially excited about in 2020 is we're going to, we're encouraging people to take individual actions of advocacy leading up to advocacy day. So we have three issue areas that we're really focusing on transportation, employment, and public access. Uh, these things are not new. Uh, the barriers that exist in these areas aren't new to the disability community in South Carolina. Uh, but this is a year wet that we're going to take some really direct action on on how to remove those barriers. So public access, we are asking people to share positive posts about what is accessible in the community. What works for you? Where do you like to go? Mm -hmm. uh, where do you like to be? How can we show that there is a benefit, a public benefit to accessibility? Uh, another is transportation, taking a ride with a community leader. If you use public transportation where you live, um, chances are your elected representation has not used that public transportation resource. So take a moment, uh, invite them to take a ride, ride with them, talk to them about what's important to you and help them get a fuller understanding of disability. Uh, also, uh, for employment, we are putting together an employment first pledge and hope to be releasing that super soon. It is a way for individuals and employers and elected officials and service providers and educators to all make one pledge to further competitive and integrated employment in South Carolina. Um, and it doesn't sound as complicated as, as it may seem. There are action steps that we can all take now to further disability employment. Uh, so we'll be taking these actions uh, leading up to April 1st. You'll see information about that on social media, on eBlast if you're subscribed. If you're not subscribed... What you waiting for? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Subscribe. You can even subscribe while you register to attend Advocacy Day. So two birds. Um, that's short for two birds with one stone. And it's actually kind of aggressive. And I'm sorry I used that <laughs> reference. Um, but yeah, some really great things that we can do. So uh, I would encourage you all to take a look out, or, or look out for content that's coming through hashtag AccessNSC. That is the hashtag that we're going to be using for this positivity campaign and to share advocacy actions leading up to Advocacy Day and, and really following Advocacy Day, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, follow AbleSC on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, if you're fancy. Um, and we'll you know be sharing all that stuff as well. Woo. So I know we just 2020, man. 2020, there's so much going on and probably even more that we can't even imagine yet. But I know we just threw a ton of content at you, a bunch of ideas. This is just kind of an overview podcast. So as since we promised you about 20 more podcasts in this one episode, <laughs> you can expect a more um, in-depth dive into a lot of these topics, as well as, you know, our website, social media always hosts more resources on where you can learn more about some of this. Get plugged in. Make that the 2020 resolution. Get plugged in to disability rights. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Get plugged into Advocacy Day. Get plugged into uh, our social. Just do it. 2020 is the year for disability rights. <laughs>